Beloved friends, <clears throat> those of you who become pioneers today will always remember that you became pioneers from the background of that beautiful music of Jack Lentz and his 14 songsters. <clears throat> as well as a real introduction to the subject by our counselor, Lloyd Gardner. And he is still our counselor, even if he was a little timid about wearing his red hat. <laughs> but I have seen Lloyd do things that really took more courage than that. And before the morning is over, I hope Lloyd will put on the hat. <laughs> Stand up. to lend it to me before this talk is over. <laughs> Dear friends, this is a most glorious conference and great things are going to flow from it. As I look over this great audience, I wonder how many of you are pioneers now. It may be that all of you are. And if so, we will have no new pioneers today. But it is planned as our dear chairwoman, Velma Cheryl, explained, there will be an opportunity and we expect this area on the floor below this table to be filled with hundreds, if not thousands, of people deciding they just must pioneer now. I want to read to you a statement of Baha'u'llah which we are all familiar with. But it is a wonderful statement. It appears in Gleanings they that have forsaken their country for the purpose of teaching our cause, these shall the faithful spirit strengthen through its power. A company of our chosen angels shall go forth with them as bidden by him who is the Almighty, the All-Wise. How great the blessedness that awaiteth him that hath attained the honor of serving the Almighty. By my life, no act, however great, can compare with it except such deeds as have been ordained by God, the all-powerful, 
the Most Mighty. Such a service is indeed the prince of all goodly deeds and the ornament of every goodly act. Thus hath it been ordained by him who is the sovereign revealer, the ancient of days. Friends, we all know that the greatest honor we can bring to ourselves, the greatest service we can render to God, is to arise, to go forth, to teach his cause all over the world. This is a privilege we have now. And we hope that before this day is over, we will have many more new devoted pioneers. Audrey and I do a lot of traveling. One of our greatest joys is visiting the pioneers in different countries, different islands, most remote places. And we are always struck with the fact that these pioneers we visit seem to be the happiest people in the world. Some of them are living under conditions that are very difficult, but they don't seem to worry these pioneers. They are serving God, and they know it, and they love it, and it just makes them, and the new believers they are attracting to the faith, terribly happy. So, friends, I don't know how many of you are pioneers, how many have come back to this glorious conference to meet all your old friends, but it seems to me there is a spirit here that I have never seen before. I have decided to tell you a story. It happens to be my favorite pioneering story. And I hope you will like it as much as I do. It happened in the year 1953. There was a conference in that year in New Delhi. And when I arrived at it, and I was not a hand at that time, I saw Mother Dunn who had been made a hand a little while before by the beloved guardian. I hadn't met her, <clears throat> Mother Dunn, Clara Dunn, before that. <clears throat> she was a dear, precious soul of, I think, close to 90 years of age. And I went right up to her and I said, Oh, Mother Dunn, I want to offer you my most loving congratulations. And she said, Don't do that to me. 
She said, I am not at all happy at being named a hand. She said, I haven't been able to sleep ever since properly at night. She said, I know the beloved guardian is under the infallible guidance of God, but somehow there has been a mistake someplace because I am totally unworthy for this great honor. And she was so sincere and so worried about this, I could hardly believe it. But when she insisted on saying that she just had never done anything and there was no reason why she should be a hand, I invited her to have dinner with me that evening so we could talk about it. And we did. And when we sat down to dinner, I asked her to tell me something about her past Baha'i life. And she began, and she told me a most beautiful story. And I shall try to tell you enough of it that you can get the picture of this dear soul, Mother Dunn. Clara Dunn, originally from California, but most recently from Australia. She said that in the year 1918, her husband Hyde, Hyde Dunn, had gone to the convention which at that time was held in New York. And he came home from it to their home where they were in California. And he was all excited because he had a document in his hand. And he said, oh, Clara, you just you wait until you see what I've got here. And she said, what is it? Well, he said, this is something we got at the convention. And it's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. He said, I have been reading it and rereading it all the way back on the train from New York to California. And this is it. And you know what it was? This was the tablets of the divine plan, which Abdul Baha had written and sent on to the Americans. And this was thought of for some years as America's spiritual destiny. But in this book, Abdul Baha had told the American and the Canadian Baha'is that he expected them to arise and take the faith throughout the world. And it's this tablets of the divine plan which the beloved guardian used as the basis of the plans he gave us. You remember the first seven-year plan in 1937 to 44, and other plans after that. And it is the same instruction from Abdul Baha, which the Universal House of Justice is using and will continue to use for many long years to come. So Mother Dunn said that she and Hyde read this 
established to the divine plan. And immediately they said, well, it looks as though the Master wants us to go someplace. And where shall we go? And for no reason at all, they both said, let's go to Australia. They didn't know anything about Australia. They had never been there. They didn't know anybody there. But it just seemed to be the right thing to do. So they sent a cable to Abu Baha, and he cabled back saying that he would be delighted if they would go. And they went. And friends, for three hours, dear Mother Dunn told me about their experiences in Australia. And I can tell you, they were wonderful experiences. They weren't young. I don't know how old they were, but I would say they were certainly in their 60s. They arrived and they had no real supply of money. And Hyde wasn't too well. But he got a job for uh, selling chocolate with a chocolate company. And he went out selling every day, and Clara visited the storekeepers and the bank managers and other people and invited them to come to a fireside. And they would have settled in a tourist home, having one off in a very small bedroom, but they would invite people to come to that bedroom. Uh, at least Clara did most of the inviting. She acted as chairman, and Hyde talked about the faith of Baha'u'llah. And they, they did this for quite a long time. And then during this dinner, Clara got to the point of telling me of the time when the first person became a Baha'i in Australia. And as she told me the story, she cried and she cried. She put her head down on the table and just sobbed as though her heart would break. They actually had brought somebody into the faith and they were so happy they couldn't contain themselves with it. And this was all coming back to her as she told the story. And she went on and told of other people who became Baha'is. But then the time when they had their first local assembly, that was another time when dear Clara put her head down on the table and wept at the thought of that. But the faith moved on, and they got an assembly in New Zealand and taught in various islands around Australasia. And she was quite happy, but you could see that they... Clyde and uh, Hyde and Clara Dunn had done some mighty teaching over the years. And finally I said to her, I said, Clara, I know why Shogi Effendi named you a hand of the cause. Incidentally, Hyde had died at, by this time, but he was made a hand too. They are the only couple of hands anywhere in the world. And I said to her, you know, Clara, I know why Shoghi Effendi named you a hand. 
Well, she said, if you do, I wish you'd tell me, because I don't know. Well, I said, look at all this work in Australia. You have a national spiritual assembly there. You've got all those local assemblies. Why, you and Hyde were the ones who laid the foundation of all the work in that great area. And I said, Clara, if I had been the guardian, I would have named you a hand of the cause. She said, you wouldn't. I said, of course I would. Oh, but she said, I'm so unworthy. I've done nothing. I said, Clara, you are not unworthy, and you have done a great deal. And I certainly would name you a hand of the cause if I were the guardian. She was so pleased with that that she almost stood up and hugged me. She said, you don't really mean to tell me that you would have appointed me a hand. I said, I certainly do. Well, then I drove her back to her hotel, and the next morning I went into the conference, and there she was looking radiant and bright, and she said to me, she said, John, I've had the first good night's sleep since I was appointed a hand of the cause, and I owe it to you. <laughs> and once or twice again in that conference, she told me the same thing. <clears throat> and then I saw her again four years later after the beloved guardian had died. We all met after the funeral of our beloved Shogi Effendi. And there Mother Dunn came up to me again and thanked me and told me that I was the one who had made it possible for her to accept her handship. Now, friends, I would like to tell you in great confidence, but you mustn't tell anybody, I have been a hand for 25 years, and I have never yet had anybody invite me out for dinner to tell me why I was appointed a hand of the cause. But, dear friends, now we come to the very important part of this particular session, and I'm having to watch my time because while our chairwoman, Velma Cheryl, looks beautiful this morning, in her lovely red suit and her lovely black hair. She looks like an angel. But I'll tell you, she's no angel. <laughs> she's the chairman of this meeting, and she told me that I had 40 minutes to speak. And at the end of that 40 minutes, I had to stop. And she was going to see to it that I did. And I don't know whether she's been looking at her watch since or not. But I want to read another small statement that we all know. 
Once again, and this time more fervently than ever before, I direct my plea to every single member of this strenuously laboring, clear-visioned, stout-hearted, spiritually endowed community, every man and woman on whose individual efforts, resolution, self-sacrifice, and perseverance the immediate destinies of the faith of God now traversing so crucial a stage in its rise and establishment primarily depends not to allow through apathy, timidity, or complacency this one remaining opportunity to be irretrievably lost. <coughs> So, friends, this <clears throat> is the moment we are all looking forward to when we call upon those of you <clears throat> who are able and willing to pioneer. And it reminds me of a time <clears throat> in that same first conference where I met Mother Dunn, we had, there were 800 of us at that conference in 1953, and we called for pioneers, and if my memory is right, from that 800 in those very early days of the faith, Seventy-five offered, and a committee was formed, and Ugo de Carey and the cause, whom many of you will know, was the chairman of it, and I was one of the other eight members of the committee, and we interviewed the pioneer offers all those people, especially the ones who were prepared and willing to go right then from the conference. And the joy of all those people, some of whom had just been Baha'is a short time, they were so happy when they were assigned a goal. It was as though God himself had handed them their goal. They were so pleased to know that they could get out and serve God and the beloved guardian in that way. I remember there was one couple there in the neighborhood of 60 years of age. One of them was a, a cook and the other one a tailor. And they said they could go to a goal, to one of these islands. But they had a little money saved up. They could pay their way there and they could earn living themselves, and they were pre prepared to go immediately. Who goes to carry greeted them very lovingly, and he said, do you want to go to two separate goals or to the same one? And I remember having that awful feeling that surely they weren't going to separate this devoted couple and send them to two separate islands, probably hundreds of miles apart. And some of those islands seem to be very desolate. And so I said to Ugo, 
You aren't going to separate this couple, are you? And he turned to me and he said, John, do you realize that when people pioneer for the cause of God, they are taking unto themselves the greatest privilege that God has ever given to man. There is nothing to compare with it. And you mustn't feel that we shouldn't send this couple to different islands. They are willing to, and they will receive the reward through all eternity in the next world. They will be known. They will be so greatly loved. And so I said no more. But when the conference was all over, I inquired and found that they were sent to the same island. And I couldn't help being rather glad of that, despite what dear Ugo had said to me. But friends, now is our opportunity, an opportunity that could never come again. As glorious as this is, in this conference of all conferences, and with the background of all this music and the beauty and the glory, now is the moment when those of you who want to pioneer and are willing, would you now stand up and come forward down to this area below our table here, and we will greet you with the greatest love. So, come on down.